We've got the uh, ETFSA, I suppose we call them the triumphant, uh, Narina Fissa hiding right up in the far back corner, uh, Mike Brown, of course we all know Mike, and then uh, Gareth Stoby. They're each going to be doing a bit, well, not each, Narina will be in the Q&A session. Uh, Gareth's going to kick off first, lay a bit of the land. Uh, there certainly is... It is interesting times in markets, but it's weird interesting, right? Because usually when I say that, it's because we're all feeling poorer, yet here today is we probably all are at maximum wealth with markets at all-time highs, local markets, offshore markets. It's a it's a weird space to be. Don't get me wrong. I like weird. I'm, I'm, I can totally live with weird. And, and then uh, Mike Brown as well. We're also going to touch a bit on the new actively managed ETF that came out from ETFSA last month, the Balanced Foundation, uh, which was an IPO and is now trading on the market. It, how it fits, what it is, and all of that. Uh, but in interests of, of moving things along, I'll hand over to Gareth. Oh, it's Mike going to go first. You are the young guy, Gareth. Gareth. <laughs> well, I'm going to kick off with a, um, just uh, taking you through the markets at a glance. There's going to be quite a quick look at uh, what's happening in financial markets. Yeah, someone's told us we had record highs. That's great. <laughs> um, but Records can go higher. You know, you can always break a record and go higher. But uh, let's have a look at the markets at a glance, and then uh, we're we'll then going to uh, uh, talking about specific products and, and things like that. So uh, the first thing we, you know, the recession. Everybody keeps talking about this recession happening in America, and you can see there the, the graph in the top right hand side. Um, you know, there was a dip in 2022 around the Ukraine war. Ever since then, you've had positive growth in America. And it's now, you know, last quarter, 3% plan on growth in a big economy like America. That's fine. That's, that's quite a high growth rate. Now, we've never had a recession with an economy at full employment. America is at 4% unemployment, and that's full employment. And secondly, it's creating 150,000 new jobs a week. <laughs> you know, so when the proposal is creating 60,000 jobs over a five-year period. They do 150,000 jobs every week. That's not an economy in recession. So you're already got an economy growing strongly. And uh, the big threat in America has been inflation. Inflation went from 2% to 9% in 2022 when there were major disruptions coming out of the Ukraine, Russia invading Ukraine. That's now out of the system. And the bottom graph on the bottom uh, on your right hand side, uh, we came from 9% this time last year, 3.7%. Now we're down to two and a half percent inflation in America, and the the, the um, momentum in US inflation is less than two percent at the moment. You take month on month inflation, so inflation's not coming out of the system. The economy is going quite strong, so there's nothing we really need to worry about. That's what the markets are telling us. There wouldn't be a record high if they were worried about a, a serious recession and serious disruptions. So uh, the um, key factors: interest rates. We keep talking about interest rates coming down, but they're now starting to come down. The Fed lowered interest rates last week. The Bank of England dropped rates. The European Central Bank's lowered rates. Switzerland, everywhere in the world. Japan interest rates are going up, but that's a different situation. Inflation is falling. Global growth is not as robust as America, but it's quite steady. And so the overall scenario is, is, fairly, is fairly good. Um, the only thing we've got doubts about is China. The Chinese economy is, is not growing as fast as everybody thought, and manufacturing production is not helping, low youth unemployment. But they've just put another stimulus package in there. And every time they throw a new stimulus package, it does help the markets kick up a little bit. But uh, So there are some doubts about China. But generally speaking, the big factor at the moment is interest rates are starting to come down. That's US Fed funds on the right-hand side. Those up at 5.25%, um, 5.5%, so it's come down to 5%. And that's a start. That's why I showed you that line of a long period when interest rates went from zero to five and a half percent in America. That steep climbing curve. That curve will come down again. Not all the way down to zero percent. I think US Fed fund rates will sit to about three percent, three to three and a half, because they won't have a normalized yield curve. They don't even have interest rates as low as they were in this last cycle. But uh, when interest rates start falling. But it always pushes the economic recovery along. Always. <laughs> because it costs you less money to borrow. It costs companies less money to get cleared up. It costs uh, uh, everybody individually has, has a little bit more money to spend because they're not paying so much on their debt. So the, the situation is quite favorable. 
And so if you look at global markets outlook, the big thing to remember in America is that earnings growth is massive in America. That graph at the top right-hand side, that shows corporate earnings just over the companies in the S&P 500. That's the top 500 companies in America, listed companies. And that number is 3.1 trillion US dollars. That's how much money is earned in one quarter. Now, 3.1 trillion US dollars is the South African economy as a whole. <laughs> companies in America are making that every quarter. This last quarter, I made 3.1 trillion US dollars. Now, that, that money is, is creating employment, it's creating wage increases, it's creating uh, uh, payments that are going into the system. It's creating uh, potentially dividends stream. Companies will pay higher dividends. So that's what's driving the American market. And the early growth is quite good elsewhere as well. As long as companies, listed companies are, are seeing growth in earnings, that typically is good for markets. And um, developed markets, well, we think there's still some growth left in developed markets because they haven't been as uh, robust as America. Emerging markets, because of China, are slightly cautious in emerging markets. And then bonds, um, I say the rate cuts are priced in. We, uh, let's just go into this next graph. Oops, no, we've, we've lost that graph. Okay. Oh, no, there it is at the bottom. Yeah. Here's Treasury 10 year bond rates. The 10 year bond in America is now trading about 3.7%. Short term interest rates are 5%. So short-term interest rates are much higher than long-term interest rates. And that's not the right way to be. A normal yield curve has short-term interest rates lower than long-term interest rates. The further right you borrow money, the more interest rates you expect it to earn or pay. And so America must go back to a normalized yield curve. But because bond rates are falling from 5%, already down to 3.7% in America, it's unlikely we're going to see massive further drops in long-term bond rates. Now, we're more positive than on equities than we are on bonds. Most of you that have got portfolios that are run by us know that in the last 18 months or so, we started moving into bonds. I mean, we held all four bonds and portfolios. We went into bonds and we'll take profits because we bought them at 5%. When the bonds go down to 3.5% or less, there's a capital profit <clears throat> and you've earned that high interest rate in the interim. So I think bonds are quite attractive from, perhaps from taking profits. So equities is a place we reckon you should be in. And perhaps from that, we can just move on to South Africa. There's negatives on the left-hand side. There's positives on the right-hand side. There's no positives and negatives. That's, that's a change. It's always been the other way around for the last while. Um, we all know the economy isn't growing at the moment. We, we avoided a recession by the skin of our teeth in the second quarter. But on the positive side, the GNU has definitely changed sentiment. Any big company presentation you go to, they're saying we, we're now seeing some green shoots, we've seen some positive implications, we're not starting to spend some money, we're going to create some jobs, we're going to create some capacity. That can, that can really explode in time. So that sentiment improvement is good. Budik Vrindel, which is where they're looking at the structural problems in the Australian economy, has worked surprisingly well. And uh, now even the opposer, I mean, was still on his department, you now realize he's working well. He's spent all his time in America saying all the structural reforms working in South Africa. And, but the good thing is he's, he's in America talking to the Americans. A couple of years ago, they only to talk to the Chinese and the Brazilians, and you know, now they want to talk to the Americans because that's where the money is. It was always going where the money is. Despite some load shedding, well, hopefully we've had, we haven't had load shedding. And my secretary tells me there's load shedding where she is, and I said, well, you're not paying the bills. She said, no, you pay the bills, but the contractors are actually, now they've got no work. The contractors are forcing load shedding on us. So we'll see. <laughs> Private sector infrastructure funding is going to be a big, big business. We've seen solar panel investment. We're going to see a lot of other investment in private private sector investment infrastructure. The two parts bonanza that's coming through. Lots of people are cashing in their retirement funds, and that's creating a, a tax uh, boom, but it's also helping will help create some spending. Interest rates are in the reduction cycle, and inflation is falling. Now, let's see what are positives for South Africa. <laughs> in the economy, we should see no positives for quite a long time. So we mustn't miss the boat in South Africa. Our equity market, um, it's still cheap. It's at record highs, as Simon said. 
And the CT paragraph on this page and Gareth edited it, but he gave me another graph to the next page. So it's a much bigger graph now. That's the price earnings ratio on the stock exchange. What are the price of shares related to the earnings? And the earnings rate's been quite good in South Africa, but it's going to pick up dramatically. The earnings are going to grow strongly in South Africa. Now, if you look at that figure, the earnings are 10.24. That's the price earnings ratio in South Africa. That's where the market trades shares relative to earnings for the entire market. In America, the PE is 26 times. That's 10.4. This is the cheapest equity market of any size anywhere in the world. And you can see, um, I don't want to point with this thing in case it doesn't work. No, no, no. I've probably messed anything up. Um, but back in 2021, uh, we were over 16 times price earnings. And we were over 20 times price earnings back in just before the 2018-2019 uh, period. We know that we're now 10,24, and the trend is downwards. The South African market has been progressively getting cheaper and cheaper. But if it starts going back to its long term average, the long term average is 16. To go from a 10 times price earnings to 16 times price earnings means about a 50% improvement in the market. It's not impossible. <clears throat> okay, and bonds, SA bonds, I think there's still some value in South African bonds. A lot of it's happened already. If you'd bought SA bonds um, this time last year, because the price of bonds has gone up as interest rates are falling, because you've got a 12% yield in any event, you'd have a 25% total return in bonds. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> but in government stock. <laughs> so bonds, I think, can still offer a bit more, but now we've got income funds, which I think will help us. In terms of the JSE, we think that with the market picking up, you should stay in large cap. Well, even mid cap, mid cap is coming from size 20 to size really 70 in terms of the biggest companies on the JSC. There's no need to go down into smart beat and to clever investment. Just go and buy the market. Go and buy a Citrix 40, go and buy an FB mid cap. If you want to sector rotate, these are the sectors that we, if you look at your portfolios, well, this is the ones we've been buying recently for the last year or so financials. With Financial index went up 32% in the last year. Well, what about property? The best performing asset class, 50% return on property shares in the last year. 52%, I think. Why? Because that market was so short after COVID, it's now starting to recover. And that's where you see recovery happening. So there's quite a few areas you can buy in the South African market. So many bonds will still stay Exposed to bonds and the portfolios you're running, your time funds and so on, you may well be taking profits both in SA and the global bonds going forward. So that's a bit of a snapshot to where we're at. Um, it's really to be positive. And uh, the last few seminars we've been doing, we've been warning people don't buy South Africa, don't buy this and the worst. That's changed. I'm an economist, I'm allowed to change my mind. <laughs> and, and I think uh, that's where we're at. Well, so let's, let's move on and let's get some of the rest of you talking. I to go. I've come to the realization that each one of us can't hold your attention for more than five, maximum 10 minutes. It's a bit of a hopping up and down to keep your attention levels at, at the required cadence. So I'm going to take um, the first goal of this evening. Tonight's all about meeting investment goals and savings goals using ETFs. And I'm going to talk about kind of uh, investing 101, basically. and how one should really balance their long-term plan with different types um, of, of assets. And I'd like to give a quick lecture almost on the difference between growth assets and defensive or income generating assets and how one should think about these two types of assets depending on how long your time frame is, what your risk tolerance is, what your uh, requirement for income is, uh, and so forth. So the first category is all around uh, growth asset classes. So these are assets, investable instruments that one should hold over the long term that one is looking to really get good capital return um, and, and total return through time. So those asset classes are typically uh, listed equity, all types of equity, US equity, local equity, global equity, and, and listed property uh, as well. Actually, now I have found at the moment we're working on a, on a new solution, perhaps Michael touched on it, where we want to absolutely max out 
um, uh, risk assets for, for younger investors who can ride growth or, or risk asset classes over a long period of time. So the thing about growth assets is that they're a little bit more uncomfortable from a volatility perspective. So uh, you need to be prepared to see days on your statement where there's a negative return over one day, one week, one month, maybe even a couple of years. But over the longer term, um, they should outperform defensive asset classes. Defensive asset classes, on the other hand, are asset classes such as bonds, debts issued by governments, by banks, um, as well as cash investments. Here, the return is obviously much less volatile, um, but your total return expectations are narrower. These asset classes are also much more uh, income generating. So if you're looking for you, perhaps if you are retired and you, if you're meeting with your financial advisor in retirement, generally a retired person would have a higher rate in defensive asset classes. They've got less volatility, more income. Uh, younger people with longer time horizon will have more growth asset classes, less income, more volatility, but more time on their side to wait out that volatility. Okay. So these are the two major barbells that one is represented with, and it kind of intuitively hopefully makes sense. And the interesting thing about financial markets is it's backed up by lots and lots of historical um, uh, data. This is uh, These two charts are taken from a database known as the, um, the DMS database. It's a bunch of um, London academics who put it together. And I've looked at returns over the last 123 years, and I've just taken the US markets uh, uh, for example. So each little block there, you can see the different year groups with equity returns, growth asset classes. You can see the returns range from minus 40 all the way to plus 60 over any, any given year. But there's quite an extreme spread. I mean, that's 100%, minus 40 to 60%. The range is very wide. But if you look at where they cluster, they cluster around the 10 to 20% return mark. So what should you expect from US equity returns over the over the very long term? You should expect roughly between in any given year between ten, so round about the ten percent mark, okay, which is a very good return in hard in in in, in hard currency. In more recent years, it's been returns even higher than that. But receiving that return in US equities of say ten to twenty percent, you must expect some years to be extremely low and other years to be even higher and, and you need to wait out long periods of time in order to get that constant return the red blocks by the way are more recent years since uh 2000 so you might be critical and say oh yes but this is 100 years look at the more recent years but the, the red blocks are the more recent years and if you if you look carefully the pattern actually repeats itself so this is almost science that one's working with around return patterns if you look in the far end that's the bond market and you can see the whole distribution of those returns is narrower. Less volatility, but if you look at where the returns are clustered, instead of being between, say, 10 and 20 being the average return, it's between 5 and 10. Um, and even even lower than that, I think more than 5 would be the average return. Mike said the long-term yield on bonds is around 3.5%. So that's what you should reasonably ex expect from the market. So our job as asset managers and financial advisors is to help clients balance growth assets with defensive assets based on their particular uh, circumstances. And, and that's known as kind of asset allocation. Now, when it comes to the ETF markets, globally, there are thousands of ETFs that represent different asset classes, different markets, different strategies, and so forth. And even in South Africa now, we have over 200 ETFs listed, and the market cap is actually also over, over, over 200 billion. So, ETFs, what started off as a very simple concept, invest in the, you know, Satrix top 40, invest 5 around a month compounded through time. You're absolutely right. That's a uh, great approach. We now spurred uh, for choice in terms of the product proliferation that has happened in the market. And in many ways, that's kind of, uh, it's done clients a disservice because now, like the unit trust market, there's an overwhelming amount of choice um, available uh, in the marketplace. So what we have decided to do recently is launch our own ETF that balances defensive assets and growth assets, but for clients with a reasonably long outlook. So it's known as a high equity fund. So it's got a, a balance towards 
high gro growth assets. It's it dominated by, by growth assets, but it does have some defensive assets because those will generally, you know, defend the portfolio and generate uh, yield as well. And we've called it the balanced foundation um, ETF. And the reason we chose that word is that regardless of who you are, you know, whether you're someone who follows these, these exciting tech stocks in the US and when splash out on, on the video stock and stuff like that, or, or, or perhaps you're into cryptos, by all means, go for it. It's important to be invested and interested in financial markets and, 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 and you know, explore them. But to anchor your portfolio, to anchor your financial plan over long periods of time and build the foundation, this is where we positioned uh, this portfolio. So whether it's to starting out, it's a great starting place, or for more um, you know, sophisticated investors who perhaps have a vast portfolio, um, it's, you know, can form the anchor or the, or the foundation of your portfolio. And it's all about achieving, you know, um, an outcome. And the outcome here is, is long-term investing over five years, trying to outperform inflation by, say, 4 to 5% over extended uh, periods of time. And as I say, we've done this by balancing growth and, and defensive assets. And you can see the balance there. So the red and the green are the, are the growth assets, essentially, and the black and the yellow are the defensive assets and the small allocation to, to listed property. So by buying one ETF that we have listed, you, you essentially immediately diversified across all of these uh, major asset classes. Um, in terms of the, so I've jumped ahead. There you are. In terms of the um, return expectations from a strategy like this, we have um, actually already been running this exact strategy within our retirement annuity, which Michael will touch on, um, over five years now, and. Interesting, a strategy like this, which is actually very strategic, very long-term, we don't chop and change between those different asset classes, has yielded really good returns relative to the industry average. So in the same way as like the Satrix Top 40 has done well relative to all of the fancy stock pickers, active managers out there, so too has this very simple design um, of, of balanced um, you know, indices that, that we put together. Okay, so just to summarize kind of the key points from it, it balances major indices like the All Country Red Index, uh, the JC um, Kept All Share Index, the South African Bond Index, Cash, and so forth. And being ETF for sale and being advocates for the ETF market, we actually use other ETFs in the construction from well-known brands like Satrix, Tenex, OneVest, and so forth. I've already shown you the track record, which in our view is very solid. And this product is... Regulation 28 compliant. Regulation 28 is one of those um, things that we use in financial markets that people don't understand what it is we're talking about all the time, but it's it's regulation that governs pension funds and how pension funds are allowed to invest and how they must be diversified. And this particular product meets all of the requirements for pension fund uh, regulation. And we launched the product in, in partnership with Prescient, who is one of the sort of the leaders in, in white label funds and in launching ETFs. And, and all, all those asset classes we've brought together at a total expense ratio, I call it um, half a percent, which we think is, is competitive. Okay, I'm not going to ask Mike to pop up again. Right, so we're in the relay race. Um, talk a little bit about retirement. Uh, um, not that most of you worried about retirement, you all youngsters, particularly the ladies in the audience, but some of the blokes probably need to think about it. Um, so the ETF is a retirement annuity fund. A, a lot of you are members of it, uh, but uh, it's a little bit unique. It's a privately owned retirement fund. Uh, it's a, uh, it only focuses on ETFs. So we only use ETFs as building blocks in, in the retirement fund. We, uh, uh, and that's been successfully operated now for, since 2013. So we've been going 10 years or so with that methodology. And as Gareth pointed out, like our wealth default portfolio, that tends to outperform the average return. So we don't have to take a lot of risk. We can run a mix of growth and defensive assets and still perform very well using ETFs. Costs are low, 1% per annum is what you pay. There's a portfolio cost of 25 basis points to run the portfolio, but that's in the portfolio. So we report our returns after costs. So you don't have to pay that cost, but just to be exposed to total costs, Tax efficient, any contribution scenario, of course, are tax deductible, and there's no tax paid within the retirement fund. 
uh, flexible user fee. This is not a wrap of fun where you locked in until you're 93 and you can't get out and you try and you can't do anything flexible. These are purely standalone uh, uh, retirement funds, long term focused, and of course, it's well governed. Uh, as uh, Gary said, we offer five different portfolios in the retirement fund. So uh, the defensive is gray and the green is, uh, is, uh, is the growth assets. So you go from a protector fund, which is cash only. Been quite nice, nine percent per annum return the last year or two, but you know as interest rates come down and become slightly less attractive, then you have a conservator which has got more allocated to bonds and interest bearing assets, the grey parts, and it's a low equity fund to the builder, which is a medium equity fund, to the default portfolio, which is now the balance foundation. So the balance foundation portfolio now replaces the wealth default portfolio, but we still call it the wealth default portfolio because some of our trustees, you know. A little bit slow in changing changing names and so on. Uh, so the low default portfolio is a high equity portfolio, and then you've got the enhanced portfolio, which is high equity as well, but with some defensive assets. As Gary said, we are uh, we're looking at perhaps bringing out a really high equity portfolio, but it'll still have some defensive assets in it. So across the whole spectrum, you can decide which portfolios you want to use and which mix you want to use, and uh, depending on your age and your your risk profile and your strategies and so on. So uh, we are adding uh, you know, more and more choice to the uh, to the retirement fund, and that's at your request as as members. Just to go back to the two points, just for a very short period of time, perhaps we can just push our memories a bit. So we've got the vested pot. That's all the money you had up until first of September this year. That's still yours. That's still the old rules. That's still the same money changes in that vested pot. So when you find your time, um, that vested pot will still have the same rules. You'll be able to draw a third of it lump sum at a low tax rate. The other two thirds will have to go into retirement annuity. But that vested pot is now fixed. It can still grow because that money is still invested in the market. But the amount of money in that is fixed. From the end onwards, 10% uh, or maximum 30,000 was seeded from your vested pot to your savings pot. And your savings pot is where from the 1st of September, one third of all your new contributions will go to your savings pot, and two thirds of your new contributions will go to your retirement pot. You can only draw money from your savings pot, not only the savings capital, but any other money that you've added to that savings pot, you can draw that at any stage. But you'll be fully taxed when you do that. And the best thing to do is to keep that savings pot going. Because the one thing to remember is that's the only retirement money you can access up until you retire. Now, up until now, you couldn't access any money in your retirement fund until you retired. Now you can access some money. So for emergencies, well, this is a real emergency, you know, it's not uh, going what's the rugby or something like that. This is a proper emergency. You can still access it, but the rest of your money is now locked into retirement. And that's all the system is. It's really quite a simple system. We've got an example here, but it's quite small writing, but we've got this bloke called Gareth, 22 years old. We've got Gareth here in the front row, uh, He's got a tax rate of 39%, so he's, I don't know, now he's joined us, it's pretty high because we pay him more than he used to get. Uh, he's got a vested pension fund of 700,000 Rand, that's his uh, pension fund that's that's operating up until 1st of uh, September. He, we've seeded that, we've taken uh, one third of that out, 30,000 Rand or 30,000 Rand of that out to his savings pot. And uh, so when he retires, in the vested component, he can still take one third as cash and he can take two thirds as he's uh, turning into an annuity. But in the savings component, he can access that savings component any time. But only once a year, and he can only draw once a year, and it's got to be a minimum of 2,000 Rand. Now, in this case, he'd be able to draw more than that. And then he's got the retirement pot, which is his two thirds contribution, um, 8,000 Rand. And so he's got now two pots instead of one pot, but he's got access to certain savings. If you transfer from your retirement fund into ETFSA retirement fund, we have to transfer in terms of those two pots. So our mutual revenue at the moment, they've divided your, your retirement fund into savings and a, uh, and a uh, retirement pot for any contributions after 1st of September, and that will be what, what gets transferred. So the system's not all that complex. It's quite simple, it's more accessible, but it forces 
need to hold money until retirement, and that's not a bad thing. And uh, so don't worry about it too much. I'd say uh, if you've got any questions or so, on, just get hold of us and we'll, 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 we'll do our best to explain it to you. But most people, I think, are now grasping it. There's been a massive drawdown from the savings components. From the ETV is only about 30 people who <laughs> drawing 370,000 Rand, which is not even a fraction of a fraction of 1% of our retirement fund. So our people are well. They're not going to access that, to, that savings pot, but they can still access if they want to. All right, so let's um, uh, move on to uh, having... Oh, no, this is Stanley. Okay, right, so we, we haven't passed the baton yet. Another new portfolio we've got is the Oyster portfolio. Now, what happened here? People said, well, I've got my post-retirement living in duty, and I'd like to have a lot of it offshore. And all of a sudden, a lot of pension funds are coming to me and saying, well, we can't take money offshore anymore because we've reached our maximum. Because so you're only allowed to take 30% of your your assets offshore in the retail space. We don't have any money to give you 100% offshore exposure. So we can introduce one. And this one is 100% exposed to offshore assets. There's no limits. We've got foreign exchange approvals all this. You won't be limited. You'll always be able to keep this money offshore. And it's the same as the uh, Balance Foundation uh, portfolio. It works on a formula basis. It's rules-based. You pick an asset allocation, 65% in global equities. We've got 25% in global bonds, and we've got some property and commodities or something in there. We can change that a little bit, but we're going to stick more to that asset allocation because it works a little with the wealth default and the other uh, portfolios we run. We find we play around too much. It often doesn't really add value in the long run. It's worth a list of portfolio. We're not posting, but the red line is how it would have performed over the last five years. The green line is all the rest. That's all the competition out there has done well. <laughs> and we're not promising that's going to happen for the next five years. But this is a nice way of keeping some of your savings, long term savings in retirement offshore. 100% uh, offshore, it's a balanced portfolio. The costs are quite low. If it's over 10 million, we we'll charge you 85 basis points. If it's less than 5 million, we we'll charge you 1.24% per annum. And that's, a, uh, that's very, very low for a low fund. <laughs> That's about one third to one quarter of what the, the, the competitive funds are. Um, yeah. And I mean, it's, it's uh, you can add it to the five portfolios we showed you earlier in the OIL funds. We've now got the sixth portfolio in the LA fund. Don't put all the money in it because offshore investments can be volatile, exchange rate can do lots of things and so on. But it's certainly worthwhile if you've got quite a long period and or you want to still build up and sustain your capital. Um, which means you're probably younger than me, but you, you know, you're older than Gareth. Um, you know, I think this, this oyster portfolio can be part of, of what you should be looking at. And uh, I think with that, I can hand over, you know, over to Gareth again. <clears throat> right, so just a disclaimer with this section, I'm um, teased by my friends for being the ult ultimate optimist on South Africa. So when people are feeling down, they sometimes find me on like a Wednesday night if they've got the mobs about the South African economy or whatever. And I play the, the role of um, sort of counsel and uh, show them the, 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 green, the, 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 you know, the green shoots and, and the positives to look at around the country. So I'm not normally an advocate for people running away from all of the opportunities that I see in South Africa, but it is my task now to talk about offshore investing and the offshore, which is very sensible regardless of whether the South African market is likely to uh, shoot the lights out over the next few years, as we think um, it may. And the, the argument comes down to diversification and asset allocation, like we spoke about earlier. And what tends to happen, not just in our market, but in markets around the world, is that investors have something called a home bias. So you live here in South Africa, you own a property here, you work here, you earn rounds, You've got a local pension, hopefully, that is also predominantly invested in RANS. Your future earnings are in RANS. All in all, you are hyper exposed to the South African economy and to uh, South, the South African RAND. Okay? You also feel more comfortable about the local market because if pick and pay is sitting as a share in your portfolio or check is sitting as a share in your portfolio, well, you buy check is 60 60 every other evening. So that feels comfortable and it feels uh, good. So this results in something called the home bias, and every country is guilty of it. Americans are more invested in America, 
than they are, than they are represented globally. Australians are more invested in Australia than they are globally. And likewise, we tend to have a bias towards South African assets as a percentage of the global opportunity set. Now, obviously, South African shares, when I say they make up a micro portion of the South African market, it's, it's absolutely minuscule, like well under 1%. Okay. So why limit yourself to 1% of global um, securities when, in fact, there's this whole wide world of uh, investments out there? And, of course, ETFs have just made that so readily um, uh, available. And investing offshore with ETFs can actually be done in one of two ways. You can either invest on the JSC in RANDs, invest in RANDs, receive your investment back in RANDs, but right now, you've got exposure to, I, I'd imagine, Mike, you would know the exact number, but 60, 70, 80 different uh, foreign-referenced ETFs. So you buy an S&P 500 ETF here in South Africa, but you're actually getting exposure to the S&P 500 index in the U.S., all European markets, all Eastern markets, all global property, all the NASDAQ, all the tech index, and what have you. So you don't have to have the complexity of moving money into hard currency, uh, opening up an offshore bank account, and, and all of those sort of things, you can just simply buy the security here um, in South Africa, and you've got a vast choice now. Or um, if you do have money offshore and hard currency, I, I come from kind of a, a generation of people that went to work in London after varsity and have now come back and got little nest eggs there and stuff like that. And, and, and maybe do have whatever, you know, some money sitting in hard currency. And they're, they're of course, your choice is not 200 uh, locally listed ETFs. You've got thousands of ETFs that you can invest um, in, in, in hard currency. So both options um, are available to you. And you really, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's become very dynamic in a sense, almost quite complex now in terms of which ETFs to choose and why when it, when it comes to these um, offshore indices. And uh, at ETFSA, we obviously help clients construct portfolios either through the round based JSC mechanism or, or um, in, 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 hard, in hard currency. And when it comes to hard currency portfolios, you're not then investing in the Satrix, OneVest, 10X signals of this world that you probably used to on the local market. Then you're investing directly into the big global um, uh, issues like iShares, Vanguard, State Street, real huge uh, global uh, uh, behemoths. I mean, each of those literally manage trillions uh, of dollars, and a lot of the money that they manage is actually passively managed um, inside indexes and and uh, ETFs. All right, we've used up quite a lot of time now, and um, so I'm going to close off there, having kept our four goals, and hand it back to Simon and ask Nina to join the stage. And um, I think we've touched on a lot of things, um, but perhaps, in a sense, raise more questions than uh, given answers. So it's now your opportunity to, to join us, Mark, if you want to come as well. Um, and Simon, um, over to you to help. Uh... Thank you. Ladies and gents, if you've got questions in the audience, we've got uh, some time here. Uh, we've also had a couple come through. I'm watching my phone because that's where I'm seeing the questions. I'm not uh, looking at my Twitters. But if you've got questions locally, uh, there's one there in the middle seat there. Before we get to that, while we get the mic across to the gentleman, why an active ETF was asked by two people on the the the, the stream um, when it is a rules based process. Uh, Narina, you're nodding enthusiastically. Well, you can, you can, uh, tell us why. Yes, I think it's a great question because I do think that it it seems counterintuitive. But according to rules, an index tracking ETF needs to track an index. In other words, if you're looking at a multi asset fund balanced portfolio, you need a multi asset or a balanced index. And we don't have any industry standards in terms of multi-asset benchmarks in the sea. So if you don't have an index, what do you track? <laughs> so it is effectively like an index tracking fund, but there isn't an index to track. So we have the strategic asset allocation, which acts as the index for this portfolio, but we necessarily have to list it under the actively managed ETF listing requirements because we can't track an index. <laughs> it's as simple as that. So don't let the 
word active in the name of the ETF trip you up and think that this is us sitting there and if Gareth had a bad night and he comes in there and wants to sell everything and Mike wants to fight him because he's feeling bullish. No, we've got a rules basis. We've got a strategic asset allocation and that is what we follow in terms of the ETF. And it can go into a tax-free account. That is the beauty of it, as long as an ETF is also registered as a collective investment scheme, or unit trust, in other words, it qualifies for tax-free investment accounts. So yes, it absolutely can. But it's not going to appear on lists because it's a... <laughs> because it's an ETF. Because, because it's, it's an ETF. listed. Ooh, uh, it's case called for JC. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, microphone, there's a gentleman there, if we can get a microphone to him quick. Evening, everyone. It's on. Not sure if I. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I have three questions, but they, they revolve around the port system. So the first one is um, I know, like, obviously, you will have already, you have like five um, um, uh, retirement strategies there. But then I just want to ask in terms of like, if, for example, I mean the enhancer one, so the three portfolios by default that are in the same strategy, right? But then am I able to probably choose, let's say, for example, um, for the vest of Moria, I want to be uh, on the moderate one, for example, and then in the in the savings one, maybe in cash, just for example, and then obviously on the retirement one, then probably remain in the enhancement. Am I able to mix and match the three? And then the second question is in terms of the fees. Um, I know because of the three plot and everything, if you withdraw, then there's on the savings plot, there will be like uh, probably a fixed uh, charge or fee. Um, does that apply throughout the management? Um, this is, for example, I'm not withdrawing, but is it a monthly charge in the in the in the savings plot or according to the? I mean, since there is like three structures there. And then but the third question is um I know obviously it's 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 something that is being taught by the government in terms of the prescribed uh, uh assets and stuff like that. Um well it's it's not there yet, but we we know our government sometimes uh, always act the opposite way, even if like people advise against whatever the decision they want to take or want to follow. Um, we, we know with the NHI, people were against it, most medical companies are against it, but they still went ahead it. Um, same with the E12s and everything. So for, for, for this one, as, as prescribed, um, it might be forthcoming, it might not happen, but there is that kind of, I will call it a risk. Um, how can we as, you know, um, clients or you, the, fi uh, the financial institutions or the pension houses, um, kind of like, Avert the risk, you know, considering that, because uh, if 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 it end up happening, thank you. One for you, Mark. Um, well, so the portfolios, um, you can choose each of those five portfolios, and you can you can mix it. So you can say I want twenty percent in the enhancer and ten percent in the protector. So you can have a mix of different portfolios. You can change your portfolio mix at any stage. Just let us know and we'll do it for you. We don't charge you a fee for that. So it gives you the ability to manage your portfolios. So therefore, if you want to sell in your savings pot, you want to have a different portfolio strategy to your retirement pot, that's fine. You just advise us and we'll do that for you. Again, no cost. Um, the In terms of the cost structures, um, We've implemented the two-pot system in ETFSA at no different cost. So we're still charging the same 1%, which isn't the same as a lot of other funds. The only charge we do impose is if you take money out of that savings pool, which you can do once a year, is an administration cost of 200 Rand, which is at the bottom end of the... Uh, and that 200 Rand is there because it's quite cumbersome. You've got to go and profit with director from SARS. You've got to do all these other things. You've then got to get the money and pay it into your bank account. So there's an administration charge. That's the only extra charge in, in the whole system. So we've tried to keep the whole thing as, as value or proposition as possible. In terms of the um, P-scribes and all the rest, the pension fund industry is massively protected, not only in South Africa, but globally. Do you know that your pension fund can't be liquidated, it can't be sequestered? SARS can't liquidate your, your pension fund to pay tax. 
is completely protected by legislation and by the constitution. So all this stuff when you know the pals and the red hats get up and they say we're going to nationalize, we're going to seize, and we're going to do prescribed changes. That can't be done. That can't be done. The prescribes could be made perhaps more onerous to some extent, but I don't see that happening either. So don't worry about that. The most protected place you can be from an investment point in South Africa is to be in a retirement fund. Okay. Uh, I mean, how are you considering uh, RAND movements going forward? <laughs> um, I know Simon recently has been talking about could we be seeing 15 to the dollar, and I think even cited as low as 14 poten uh, potentially. I might be misquoting you there, Simon. Uh, yeah, probably. I, just quick preference. I, I'm old enough to have seen the RAND gone from 1361 in December 21st, 2001, down to five rand seventy five. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so uh, you're talking about uh, offshore investment, your oyster. I'm not dealing in that area, but you're looking at going offshore. Uh, this new ETF that you're offering has got a quite a, a large offshore allocation as well. Um, what are your concerns around that, and how are you viewing that going forward? Look, you're looking at me, which is a pity. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, the land can move around quite a bit. It can strengthen as well as weaken. But if you look at the last 20 years average, the land depreciates by 9% per annum against the US dollar on average. And if you're in a long term investment so like the Oyster, you must go for that, that 9% per annum depreciation. That's probably going to continue going forward. And so you should use this sort of opportunity when the RAND is strengthening to buy those offshore type portfolios um, without having to go to forecast. You say, I'm going to wait because next year it's going to be 15, but it may not be 15. So rather just use the opportunity that you've had by the RAND coming back from 18 down to 17, and I think it will go a bit stronger. But nobody can forecast the RAND, but uh, use these opportunities to to make sure that you are exposed to global assets because you're buying those global assets cheaper because as the rand appreciates, they, they're cheaper in dollars and other hard currencies. So I think that's probably the best way to answer it, but uh, I'm not prepared to forecast the rand. I would reiterate what Mike says. So I, I, have, I have two simple philosophies with investing offshore. The one is I buy a local global ETF, right? So that is buying it in Zar, but it is dollar, and it's got euros and sterling and everything else in there. And I buy that every month. Bang, I buy it. Every quarter, I externalize uh, money, some some Zar offshore. Uh, this Monday, I did it at 1710. I've also done it at 19 and change because every quarter I externalize because my ability, you know, I can make a compelling argument which takes our rand to 12. And that compelling argument is the GNU is great, the dollar weakens and commodities boom, because typically it's the commodity boom that really drives it. Look at what happened in 2021 during the pandemic. We can make a compelling argument and I could be 100% wrong, all right. And I'm, I would never put money on my own compelling argument. So I just have a process Quarterly, I externalized uh, Zara into dollar. I, I'm not changing the amount. My wife and I just sold a, a, a flat of ours. Uh, we're going to receive money. The plan had been, we're going to take that. We're going to externalize most of it. Uh, and that remains the plan. What we would do is we will probably externalize it over, over a, a period of a year just to remove that. Now, the last thing you want to do is move money at 1710 and you think you're a genius and six months later it's 1610. So what do I do? I manage that by just slicing it into pieces and doing it over a period of time. I'm just doing rand cost averaging. Because I can tell you, to Mike's point, there will be a time in our life when we will look back at, forget 17 to the rand, we will look back at 19 to the dollar and think, yo, we wish we could have that again. <laughs> you know, apart from a couple of, I mean, you know, invariably, and at the moment, I mean, beginning of this year, when we were 18 and change, every single cent I take on offshore, except for one or two transactions, was in the money every single time. And I, as I said, I mean, I've bought it some, what at the time seemed, I, I took money off at 1361, took a decade to get back there, but it did. And it will, Iran will weaken again. Well, no idea. How much? We'll find out. If I can maybe also just add to that, your motivation for investing offshore should not be about what can I get from the rand. 
So it's not about looking for additional return from the RAND weakening. It's about getting exposure to growth cycles, to industries, to investment opportunities that we don't have in South Africa. That's the main argument for investing offshore. The RAND is a is, is, is either a bonus or it's a bit of a, a, a draw on it. But focus on the diversification of investing in that other 99% of the investment universe out there compared to the 1% that we have locally. Yeah, and there was a question which is around the rand from the webcast as well. Should I bring money back? Um, I, I, I don't know, and I've never bought money back in my life. I, I, you know, it's, I earn an income every month, so I don't need to. But my plan would be at some point when I stop earning, I suppose, is I would have externalized most of my my wealth. Um, and what I want in rands is probably my next couple of, you know, two or three years of spending. Um, and, and, you know, because I've got costs in rands. And the last thing you want to be doing is bringing it back at bad levels. But uh, I, mean, I don't bring back, I don't know if anyone else has more cunning views to that. I'm just not smart enough to do that. I actually don't know how to do it. I've never done it. <laughs> the, the, the one thing about being retired and having too much money offshore is that if you draw, if you have a high drawdown rate on your retirement yeah. uh, earnings, then, then you do need to be quite circumspect around what your offshore onshore allocation yeah. is. Because onshore, you're going to get, generally speaking, much higher yields from local assets, from cash, from bonds. And, and when you're drawing an income in retirement, you don't want to be exposed to very volatile um, exchange rates because that can have <clears throat> detrimental effects to your living in your T uh, 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 policy. So so the rule of thumb is, I think, if you're only drawing, say, 2% in retirement, then by all means, you can be 100% allocated to, to the oyster. But as soon as you get up to 4 5 6 7%, then you do need to have a good portion of your assets in rands and match to your to your uh, local liability. Yeah. Uh, there's a question there. So, I like those my What's the No, my wife is here. Don't mention it. Thank you. Going by leaps and bounds, I think. Um, system or uh, um, according to me, against the news dollars, um, whatever I did yet, just uh, or just saying, uh, no. Well, so you know, the US dollar is the of the, of the global financial system, it has been ever since the Second World War. Before that, you had a mixture of gold and sterling and so on, but since the Second World War, it's a dollar-based system. There's just so much dollars out there that no one wants a weak dollar for a length of time because everybody's invested in dollars. So I wouldn't, you know, you're going to see some volatility in the dollar, as Simon said. There's going to be a period where the dollar could fall, interest rates are dropping in America. That might lead to some weakening of dollars uh, of the dollar. But in the long run, that's your global new world currency. And everybody, including the Chinese, and everybody invests all their assets, all their reserves are held in dollars. Same as South Africa. Most of our foreign exchange reserves are in, are in dollars. So I'm not worrying about that particularly. Uh, um, until something can replace it. Now, you've got, us, you've got the BRICS who are saying, oh, we want to become a reserve currency. But the Chinese don't talk to the Russians, and the Russians don't talk to the Brazilians, and there's no way they can get form a, a union or a stable currency system. All these different countries and all the rest. You want one single country that can form, can be the bedrock of your financial system, which is America. It used to be gold, but there isn't enough gold in the world to be able to play that role. So you worry about, you know, don't worry about that, worry about, you know, some other stuff. I mean, that's what's important. Yeah, I would add to it. I mean, as long as I have been in the markets and, and I haven't been in the markets since Bretton Woods, I'm not quite that old, but as long as I have been, there's been theories around the dollar, the, the, the death of the dollar. Uh, the big one, of course, was the advent of the euro. I mean, if there's going to be a currency that takes over from the dollar, is it BRICS or is it euro? I mean, it's probably more likely euro. And 25 years in, the euro has made a small little dent. Yeah. And, and I mean, it's, yeah. will the dollar die one day? Yeah. It's going to outlive all of us, all of us in this room. Even, I mean, there's no real proper youngins. And my niece who's 
in grade eight and has decided she's had enough of school two days back at school this term she's like i know this thing is terrible <laughs> even for her i mean the, the, the dollar will over time perhaps but it is as mike says it's the currency in which the world trades we can like it or not and the BRICS nations don't but dying it is yeah um just a question on the sector around technology technology is growing quite a bit uh, you'll see in the video, you'll see the cloud companies, you can see AI. Um, I just want to get an understanding around the portfolio that you presented. How, how can you complement, firstly, two questions. What is your view around the technology uh, sector growing both locally and globally? Secondly, uh, how can you complement the technology sector and portfolio as part of the ETF currently, whether it's Oyster or the balance portfolio? How can you actually make sure you're grabbing that benefit? Because we look at the stocks alone, um, Nvidia has grown 120%. Microsoft AI companies are moving quite fastly. So if you're not in that basket, you're not you're not bearing the fruits of the benefits going forward. Mm -hmm. Sean, have a <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll have a first stab, and Mark and Reed might have slightly different views. But the Magnificent Seven and these tech stocks that have uh, driven the world over the last few years. I, I suppose the first point to to point out is that they are at their valuation for a reason, and that there's a lot of uh, a lot of global capital that backs that valuation, and they've obviously done an, uh, enormous things to to get to the size that they have. There's been a lot of earnings growth and so forth, but they have come to dominate many global indices. So whether you're looking at the Nasdaq index, the S&P 500 index, or even the global index, those tech stocks have risen to become um, a large portion of any of the major um, indices. Um, are they overvalued? Well, that's a debate that we can have until mm -hmm. one o'clock uh, tomorrow morning type, type of thing. So what we look at sensibly is to make sure that clients are exposed to those growth sectors, but they're exposed at an appropriate level and that they have got some exposure to other more boring sectors, so um, consumer staples and other defensive type stocks. There's a lot of talk in global markets at the moment around the great rotation out of these tech stocks that have run so hard into more boring kind of industrial stocks. So we did research recently on uh, US mid-cap stocks. So the next, four, is it 400 after yeah. the S&P 500? Um, the S&P 400, which is the next 400 stocks after the S&P 500 stocks, which obviously aren't dominated by those mega tech stocks. And should they, this rotation trade that people are talking about play out, well, then we've got some exposure in, in client portfolios. But we're not brave enough to say that we don't want to have any exposure to those stocks because they're an important part of the world economy and, and are, are driving our lives in many respects. In fact, a lot, a lot of the time, you don't even have a choice in terms of how <laughs> they're driving our lives, not so. So, um, yeah, that, that's how, how we view it. And I don't know, Matt. I don't know if I could can maybe add to that also, I think why we are positioning the Balanced Foundation ETF as a core building block, a foundational building block in a portfolio, is that it is very well diversified, broad-based, and purely because of the size of these megatech companies, but they will necessarily form a fairly substantial part of that portfolio. But then you can supplement it in any direction that you want to. You might be of a view that you want to have more tech, you want more of the mega techs, or you want more of smaller tech companies, or whatever the case might be. You can then, almost on a satellite basis, add additional exposures. Or you can look at this and say, this is a little bit uh, too much offshore for my liking. I'm going to supplement it with more South African assets or more income generating assets. So you can, from that very well diversified core building block, now explore into the direction that your goal requires you to be positioned. And I think that's what makes it really powerful. Um, maybe just a comment in terms of tech. I think tech has become so dominant in terms of it. It's, it's certainly not just the information technology sector that represents it. It cuts across all industries, whether you're talking fintech or health tech or tech in, in real estate or tech everywhere. So it's become a predominant theme Anyway, as Gary says, we don't really have much of a choice. We're exposed to it anyway, but we can consciously balance that out based on our views or on our goals or our requirements. I've got two more questions coming here. Sean's talking around uh, U.S. earnings uh, broadening out and, and the rally broadening from beyond the mag seven, and he is correct. The other 
unmagnificent 493 I suppose <laughs> are picking up a bit but another question he has how often do you rebalance the the the, the portfolios so far maybe something like the foundation portfolio for example the beauty of having it traded every single day we never have to proactively rebalance this because cash flows that come into the portfolio are just used to make sure that we are aligned with that strategic asset allocation. So there's no need to rebalance the portfolio when you actually have it running on that basis. And um, I think in terms of our many of our other portfolios, especially where we do apply much more active oversight, especially in some of our private client portfolios or some of the individual portfolios, we review that on a regular basis. Reviewing it doesn't necessarily mean that you make changes, but you look at it and you ensure that it remains consistent with the goal that the investor has, the objective in terms of what you're trying to achieve. And where possible, we use cash flows to do that. We've just started distribution season. The first ETF distributions were announced today for the next quarter. So we use cash flows as and when you can. Um, and we also do that very much with a tax view in mind. You don't go and just Throw out of stuff just for the sake of it without considering what the tax implications of that might be. Many asks, many Patel asks, which RA product gives maximum uh, foreign exposure, which would be 45% as per Reg 28? Or... Well, we're at the moment we're, um, we're at 35% exposure, and that's not all in equities. That's, uh, that could be bonds and, and the all the better commodities and loans of portfolio. So we haven't gone to the 45%. Um, but watch that space, the new, what are we calling it, the wealth velocity portfolio? That will be a bit higher. It will be a bit more sure exposure. So we want to fill that gap in a little bit. Okay. But at the moment, we haven't decided to go the full 45% full, uh, offshore on our portfolios. And I think that's, I mean, the specs being the right decision because the returns have been coming in some of the other asset classes. And not directly into offshore equities. Yeah, it's up closer to 45, and I'm pulling that number down. Sure. I've got a last question. It's your oyster, your currency portfolio. Uh, he asks what the minimum is, if there is such. And he asks, that, does it have to be uh, offshore domicile bank account? Is it a dollar based portfolio or is it a czar on your side? So, what's the minimum? And is it dollar or czar based? Okay, so we so need. Should perhaps clarify the the oyster portfolio is a portfolio that we built for our living annuity product specifically for so for our retired clients who want to have more Got offshore. You. But it is it does demonstrate how we would think about building an offshore portfolio anyway. So if that portfolio uh, were in if, if we had a client who, who had um, a random list and wanted to invest offshore, we would select a group of ETFs, not just similar quite honestly to what the oyster looks like. Or in hard currency, also again, not to send it to. It's because in each case, we're choosing sensible indices that represent the different asset classes that we want exposure to. Uh, US market, S and P five hundred, global property, a diversified global property index, and so forth. But I suppose we're packaging these portfolios for different life use cases. I think to, tonight we sort of just touched on a bit of everything, uh, but they're, they're also portfolios specifically for our retired. Plans. Gotcha. In, in the absence of the, those portfolios being readily available from other providers, because a lot of the other providers have pulled back uh, their offshore product range. Yeah. Ladies and gents, I'm going to leave it there. If there are more questions in the audience, there's one more up there. Let's grab that, and then you can chat with the esteemed uh, uh, triumphant of uh, ETFSAs. I can't see you because of the light, but yes, there you are. Good uh, evening. Uh, I think I, I just should state that I'm, I'm, I'm still in terms of uh, investments, your retirement amenities, and your offshore investments. However, I just wanted maybe to uh, get some some clarity maybe from uh, our specialist at the front today in terms of uh those offshore investments that they were talking about to see in terms of the war, the escalation of the war that is happening in in the Middle East. Uh, the, because I, I understand that war brings disruption and brings 
uh, instability in, in terms of uh, the global market. So I just wanted to understand, uh, maybe speculatively speaking, uh, how do you see maybe in the next 10, 15 years, uh, maybe the, our in, offshore investments playing out because it seems like maybe it's it's something that I'm thinking because if you are reading the news, you'll hear of uh, the retaliation uh, that is expected maybe from Israel uh, to Iran uh, oil refineries and I think maybe in the past two three years with the war uh, uh, between Ukraine and Russia. It had some economic here in South Africa. Uh, the, the the property market was uh, uh, inaccessible because of the rising prices. Petrol was out of this world, and inflation was just going out of. So I just wanted to get a sense. Uh, yeah. Please don't hang on here. I'm still there. Do you want to? Yeah, I think uh, the Russian economy has been going on for what, maybe two years. Um, Almost three. Um, yeah, yeah. It's been two, 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 so yeah. uh, we've been watching into three years. And the markets have recognized. So there was a disruption, but over the short term, and global markets tend to learn to live with those sort of disruptions. So the, the disruptions to oil supplies, to global shipping, and so on, it's all been worked around. The Middle East uh, situation, last year as it is, very localized. It's a small world. We've had lots of those in recent times. You know, the Ibis, you know, what happened in Syria and the rest. So um, what really becomes ma massively disruptive is if you have a global war. And I don't see any real risk to that because I think, you know, you're too young, but I think a lot of people in this world live through the horrors of the Second World War where 90 million people died. <laughs> they don't want that sort of thing again. So don't worry about those geopolitical events. You can't forecast them. You can't determine what's going to happen. Just focus on things that drive markets, like interest rates, like inflation, like earnings, and that's your best strategy. If you start worrying about shocks, which are war is a shock, if you expect it and it happens, then you're never going to be a successful investor. So... Uh, you know, you, the concerns you raise, I think markets take all that into account and it gets priced into markets over time. So uh, uh, don't be too concerned about that. But you, you raise a good point. Do I have all my exposure offshore? Well, maybe I should have some in South Africa. South Africa is one of the most disruptive, uh, volatile countries in the world. And yet, well, the markets are very I have a bit of money in South Africa as well. So try and spread your money as much as possible. But don't have anything sitting with sure if that's going to concern you, that it's out of your control. Yeah, no one's invading us at this point. Yeah. <laughs> if I may add to that also, um, coming back to the idea, tonight was all about goals. How do you actually meet your investment goals? And probably the most important thing to do is to match your time horizon with your investment strategy. You mentioned where would we be, we'd be in 10 to 15 years from now. None of us know. But we've got that 123 years worth of evidence that shows us that markets adjust. So 10, 15 years from now, it will have adjusted to that. So if your time horizon is 10, 15 years or longer, then you should be invested in growth assets, globally diversified, local and offshore. If your time horizon is shorter, you either in retirement, you need to earn an active income from your investments, or you've got a specific goal to be able to pay for something in the next three years or five years, then a bigger proportion of your money should not only be in local assets, but in defensive assets, assets that can give you good interest, that can give you good dividends and so on. And we've got the luxury of both of those. So the ability to match your investment goals with ways to implement them using ETFs there are infinite choices in terms of that. And that's really what you should be focusing on. What are your objectives and how do you best translate them into an, an appropriate strategy for your objectives rather than worry too much about all those things that are completely outside of our control. Yeah. And the biggest thing in investing always time. 
the more yeah. we have, yeah. the easier it is. Ladies and gents, we'll leave it there. Thanks, Thanks very so much. much. Uh, go Stoby, Nirina Fissa, uh, Mike Brown, uh, and to everyone who came through to Santin, we really, really appreciate you giving up. You had lots of options for your hour this evening. You chose to spend with us. For that, we thank you. Everyone on the webcast, ditto. Uh, everyone, have a great evening further. Look after yourself if you can. Look after somebody else as well. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Thanks.